Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 1. Matthew 18 and verse 1. Reading in the King James Version, won't you follow along in the text before you? At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, if it, would, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet and be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed, that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye? If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he findeth it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more than uh, of that sheep, than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Let's pause there and go to the Lord in prayer. We give each believer in Jesus Christ the opportunity to prepare your heart for the study of God's Word. As we study God's Word, we need to have open hearts, hearts that are receptive of what the Spirit has to say. And that's done by confession. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then ask that God might teach you through the power of his Holy Spirit and minister to you from from this text to your heart. We pray these things in the secrecy of silent prayer. Father, what joy is ours to come into this place and to gather with these men who love you and serve you and want to know more about your word. What a privilege it is to be with our brothers in such an extent, to study the word, to find understanding, to let your spirit lead us and direct our thoughts. You know the needs of every man in this room and each of the things that we're going to face in these coming weeks. I pray, Father, earnestly, that you might prepare each man individually according to the need that's coming up. We give you thanks and praise ahead of time for what you're going to do and thankful for your holy word. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do pray. Amen. We've been following our outline of the book of Matthew and we've come to the fifth point, the pedagogy of the king. I said without Reservation. I have no problem calling it pedagogy, even though the subject is the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, because the previous points were the person of the king, the proclamation of the king, the proof of the king, 
the purpose of the king, all starting with the letter P, then therefore the pedagogy of the teaching or the teaching of the king is what we're looking at. And it will go on until chapter 20. Um, we're at the at point um, would be F. We looked at um, the teaching as it applied to his church, the teaching of the Lord as it applied to death, his own death. In chapter 17, we looked at his teaching. He shared about his teachings, about his glory, his betrayal, and taxes. If you remember, we covered those three last week. This week, we'll be looking at one, and that is concerning humility, his teaching in reference to humility. And if you keep it clear within your mind that the teaching that he is doing in this entire chapter is on the subject of humility, you won't be led down some primrose path by some radio preacher telling you what is being taught in this particular chapter. Because some marvelous heresies, some delightful diversions from God's word have been taught on this particular chapter um, simply because they didn't know what is Jesus talking about. They see him speaking about this and that and whatever and then they go off running in their own in their own direction. We're going to be looking at humility and it is exemplified, it is illustrated, it is diagrammed, it is described in childlike faith, verses 1 to 6, in seeking the lost, 7 to 14, in the church discipline, 15 through 20, and in limitless forgiveness, 21 through 35, one of the most powerful passages in Scripture. We start off by looking at humility and Jesus' teaching, and he exemplifies humility in the aspect of childlike faith. Look at that verse 1. And the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, see the purpose? See the subject? Humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This event takes place while the disciples are still in the city of Capernaum. The disciples ask Jesus a question. Um, according to Matthew, according to the other Gospels, it looks like Jesus called them on the rug. That he, he overheard them talking about, well, I think, you know, so-and-so ought to be this. And from the prime minister, I would put uh, brother so-and-so. And for, for the, the uh, treasurer, we, well, Judas has done a good job. I think, you know, and they're, they're picking out different jobs in the kingdom, in the political kingdom, and as they're thinking, but they said, you know, the number one, though, who would be number one? Would it be Messiah himself would be number one? Or what about Peter? Peter seems to, to end. As they're having this discussion, Jesus calls them on the rug and asks them, what are you talking about? And oh my goodness. Matthew puts it very nicely and said that the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That is a really nice way of putting this particular situation on the board. Who is the greatest? The word he uses there is mei son. Mei son. Mei son um, in the Greek talks about greatness. It also talks about size. What should I put? Largeness? Um, that which is that is which is great, that which is large, that which is huge. And then if you notice the the 
text as I read it to you, you have this greatness, what man, okay, what man is the greatest here, and then you see it juxtaposition with little child. And he uses the word in the neuter for child. It's not little boy, not little girl. It's a neuter term, which means just a youngster, very small youngster. Uh, it can be from a toddler on up into grade school somewhere. Who is, when it comes to men, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The disciples were still anticipating that soon institution of the early kingdom, uh, speculating what great political positions they would have in that regency. Perhaps it had been kindled by the prominence that the three disciples, remember, Peter, Peter Andrew, James, and John, those, um, those three, the pre preeminence that they got, it, I just gave you, three, I just gave you four, like a, like a crazy man. Peter, James, and John, okay? Peter, James, and John. I put Andrew into the list, and he's probably off talking to some kid at the time, if you know him very well. This is at Caesarea, that's what's that, Caesarea Philippi, if you remember. And they were given kind of a prominent position to go up on Mount Hermon and to actually see the transformation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They come back, mums the word, they're not telling anybody about what happened up there, but something significant occurred. The other disciples recognized that. Was it because of that, those three guys? Or is it Peter in the temple tax? Did Jesus pay your taxes? Pay Peter's? Could, I mean, if you can pay Peter's with, with fish, let's all go fishing. We could, he could pay all of them. And so they're trying to figure out, well, well, he did it for Peter because Peter's the greatest. Why do you say Peter's the greatest? I often thought that, and the discussion is going on amongst the disciples. And so Jesus is approached or Jesus gets into it. And who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In response, we see verse 2. Jesus called a little child. Um, give it to you just for fun. Padion is the word. P-A-I-D-I-O-N. Padion. And it just means child. It doesn't mean boy or girl. It's just child. Um, and it's always in reference to a very small child. One would not talk about one's adult son or daughter with the use of this. Jesus takes this little kid and he stood him or her in the midst and he told the disciples to change in their values and their thinking. Greatness in Christ's kingdom was not on based on great works. What things have you performed? Great performances. It's not based upon great words. What marvelous speeches, sermons, messages you have given. But the greatness in Christ's kingdom was on a childlike humility in the spirit. So when we talk about humility, Jesus talks about humility. The first example he gives is this little youngster, childlike faith. Jesus' re, um, reply indicated that they were asking the wrong question. They shouldn't have been concerned about, uh, they should have rather been concerned about serving the Lord, not asking about the positions in the kingdom. The disciples needed to be converted. He uses the word strefo. Strefo is to turn one around. Convert is a perfect English word for that. 
Convert means you're going in this direction, and then you're converted. Now you're going in this direction. You go just the opposite. Then Wait. Say changed. Changed it right. is fine. Uh huh. Because it's it's the word to turn around, going one direction and go, now going in another. They needed to be converted and become like little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I understand most people who read this text read it just cursively and they don't stop and consider that it's the disciples of Jesus Christ that Jesus is saying you must be converted. It would be hard for you and I to say that to Peter. Okay? <laughs> We would just assume he's a disciple of Jesus at this time. Surely he's, at some point in time, been converted. But all of this is still quite new to the disciples. Verily I say unto you, truly, this is very important, I'm saying this to you, except ye, plural, disciples, ye be converted and become as little children, Y'all, ye, shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. All the men heard this. Converted, be childlike in your faith. All the men heard it. Not all the men did it. Judas would be outside of this, right? And he heard those words on that very afternoon. And he was not converted. He did not come with childlike faith. Look at verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humble. Um, the Greek word for humble is trap pei no Trapeni no o, which means to bring low. Um, thus giving us our word humble, and it's translated humble um, throughout this the scripture. Interestingly, it's third person singular. He's talking to the group. Y'all got to be converted. Y'all got to... And then we see in verse 4, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, each of you individually, if you will humble yourself. It's also um, third person singular. It's act in the active voice. And it's in the future. He's looking at them doing this at a point in time on down the line. How does a little child humble himself. How does a little kid, if we were to bring a little kid in here, how would that little kid humble himself before all of you adults? Showing respect to us. Okay, showing respect, good. No pride, okay. No achievements. No achievements. Uh, you're basically telling me about the little child before he walked in the room. He comes into the presence of an adult in a humbled position. He doesn't have the vocab. He doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't have the money. He doesn't have the power of the adults that are in that room. And so for him to be humble is not a, a, a process, something that he needs to do. How do you humble yourself before the Lord and before others? Now it becomes where you're starting to think, what does humility involve? What, what do I do? Robert Fulgham wrote in the Kansas City Times, most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten, you've heard this before. Wisdom, he says, was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, 
but they're in the sandbox in nursery school. He goes on and says this. It's brilliant. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. You sound like my wife. <laughs> Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. And when you go out into the world, watch for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. Is he right? We about learned all of that in the humility of being a young child. Verse 5 says this, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend, offend, here's that word, we've been hitting it constantly um, throughout our study of the book of Matthew. Scandalizo. Um, Scandal. Gives us our word scandal. It's to cause someone else to sin cause someone to sin. Whosoever shall offend, shall cause someone to sin, one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Their service needed to be directed toward people. For Jesus spoke about welcoming a little child in his name. Little thought was directed in those days towards children. But Jesus did not overlook children. In fact, he gave a stern warning concerning any who might place a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in him. The word offend, scandalizo, to cause to fall would be a good translation of that word. Um, It's a verb that we've hit 13 times in our study of the book of Matthew. It would be better for such an offender to have a millstone hung around his neck and be thrown into the depths of the sea. The modern translations add the word large or great or heavy to the word millstone. Let me just stop us for one moment and look at what we've we've covered because there was a change that occurred within this verse that unless you're reading it in the Greek, you won't sense it. Our English translations do not help us out at all in regards to the, to the change that came in front, uh, came in this verse. <coughs> For he says in verse 5, this little child... And I told you that it was this word, by e di on, which means a little youngster. But in verse six, I, in verse six, he uses a totally different phrase, and that is micron. Where's my there? I want it to be near this. All right. It's me, kron, uh, which we would translate as little. Um, ah, it's in my text here. And tuton. In English letters, it would look like this. Me, kron, tuton. Little ones. It's plural. He says, But whosoever shall offend, shall trip up, shall cause to sin, one of these little ones which believe in me. Now it's very easy to say, Oh, little ones. He's talking about the... He took it off there. 
Ayi, Yun. He's talking about this, this little child, right? Well, you would think so, because you're reading English. But if you read this, you'll realize that this is in the neuter. And that this is in masculine. And it would have just as been easy to say little ones and utilized instead of micros, which would be what he'd be using in this to come out with micron to get it into the plural. He's using the masculine. It would have been just as easy to do it in neuter. Because this word, micro, can be given in the masculine or feminine, little girl, little um, whatever, and then in the neuter for a, a little it, you know, that, that you want to say. So it had been very simple for him to do this in the neuter. He did it in the masculine, which changes the meaning of this. No longer are we looking at this word. We're looking at little children who believe in him. You must be converted, he says. You see, he changed the subject here. You must become like little children to enter the kingdom. And anybody that trips up a little guy like that, he's talking about you and me, as new believers in Jesus Christ, whoever trips them up, well, he said, better for them. A millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea, says my King James. Little brutal. Um, let me share with you what's there. The word millstone, many of your modern translations, if you're looking at a different translation than King James, you probably have a word like heavy, big, large, you know, great, something like that, added to that word millstone. Because that word that is the, the two words that are being translated to make one word millstone in my King James are these words. Let me give it to you in English letters. Mulos oinikos. Mulos is the word mill. And you can add a mill thing. A mill something or other. Okay? It's talking about the millstone. But then oinikos is the word Actually, this ending is belonging to. It's really fun. The millstone that's belonging to the donkey. Ah, uh, now you're picturing a different millstone than maybe you did the first time I read this. A millstone, right, that a lady grinds. The... No. Millstone that a donkey pushes these huge millstones that is grinding up a lot of, the, uh, of uh, grain. So, better for him to have one of these millstones about this big hanging about his neck and that he were, my King James says, drowned. Most of the translations use the word drowned, which I find quite interesting because it doesn't have the word drowned in there. There's a word for drowned, okay? But he just didn't happen to use it. He used the word kata pontizo. Kata pontizo. That verb, kata pontizo. Kata means underneath. Pontizo, the river. Under the water. You would translate this in our tongue as submerge. Better for him that a huge, gigantic millstone were hanging about his neck and that he were submerged in the depth of the sea. Boy, that picture is pretty strong. 
in, in the original. And so this is what he's picturing to them. That humility, true humble person, doesn't concern himself with his title. Um, doesn't concern himself with his position. A truly humble person doesn't consider, put into respect, his power. No more than a child would consider of title, position, or power. But is concerned about the opportunities for effective service. A humble person is more interested in, what can I do? Is there something I could do? Is there something to... That attitude is much different. It's exemplified with childlike faith. As a child, doesn't have to work at being humble. A child just is humble because of who he is in society. And second, humility is exemplified in seeking the lost. Look at verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses. Same word, scandalismo. For the, it must needs be that offenses, same word, come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. It's better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands, two feet, and be cast into everlasting fire. We're obviously talking about more than in an infraction, right? We're talking about an individual who has never received Jesus Christ, never been converted, never had childlike faith. This person is lost eternally, and he is going to where? Everlasting fire, or eternal fire. Verse 9, And thine eye offend thee, cause thee to sin, pluck it out, Cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes be cast into hellfire. <clears throat> He's not saying that you looked upon something and it was naughty. And when you looked upon that, now you're heading for hellfire. No. The person who looked at that probably was heading for hellfire. He was he heading for ever everlasting fire. He was going to hell, and so he offended. Poor guy. He would have been better if he would have been blind than have this as a hindrance, this offense to cause to sin, scandalismo. This stands as a stumbling block for him. It's like throwing up a wire fence around him and keeping him where he's at. Where is he? He's on his way to hell. He's on his way to perdition. Too bad he still has both eyes. Possibly, if he didn't, his thoughts would have been different. In verse 9, uh, verse 10, Take heed that ye, y'all, despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. Now think ye, the man have a... Oh, and then he goes on and gives a parable on that subject. A truly humble person helps build others up, not tear them down. He's a stepping stone not a stumbling block. Yes, brethren, we're still talking about the subject of humility. And how is that expressed? It's expressed in seeking the lost, those who do not know um, our Lord. Jesus pictured this by talking about those who cause offenses, cause others to sin or themselves to sin. Um, it was obvious such individuals were present in Jesus' time. They are today. But the judgment of God, huh, and he mentions it, woe, and then twice, woe. Remember, twice he used that, that word, woe. 
And then he used the word everlasting fire. And then he used fires of hell. These things are going to fall upon them because they are failing to deal with the basic cause of their sin. What is the cause of their sin? They have not been converted. As it says in verse um, 3, they do not have childlike faith. Therefore, they must humble themselves as this little child, and the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This humility is exemplified by their willing to seek out those who are lost. Jesus was not teaching of self-mutilization. If you go to self-mutilization from this, then you're missing the whole subject. Humility. Okay? Um, He's not talking about cutting off one's own hand or foot or gouging out one's eye. Doing that would not remove the source of the offense. What is the source of the offense? The sin in the life. Chapter 15 and verse 18. Turn there. Chapter 15, 18. We've already been over that. Matthew chapter 15, starting with verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness. What's the source? It's not your hand. It's not your eye. It's your heart. And that's the problem that de- is being dealt there with is an individual who has not received Christ. To keep from leading folk into sin, radical decisions, costly changes often are necessary. The disciples here in front of Jesus were reminded of the value that the Lord places on these brand new believers. These little ones, these micron tutons, are important to God. It may be that God has entrusted the care of them to a specific group of angelic beings, talks about their angels there, who are constant touch with the Heavenly Father. Um, Acts chapter uh, 12 and verse 15 is a a good picture of this. Uh, Yeah, just really quickly. Acts uh, chapter 12 and verse 15. Acts 12, 15, we read, And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but she ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said to her, You're crazy, thou art mad. And she consistently, uh, constantly affirmed that, that it was even so. Then they said, It's his The early church believed that individual believers in Jesus Christ had angelic beings that kind of watched over you, protected you. This verse, um, obviously in Acts, obviously, but this verse in Matthew is not speaking about angels protecting little children. Aw, children have their own little guardian angel. I'm sure you've run into enough Roman Catholics to hear that one a time and time again. And what does that guardian angel do for them? I don't know. If you go into the Catholic cemetery, you'll see see graves of little children and a little angel over them. Obviously, (laughs) that angelic protection didn't seem to do much good there, if indeed it is, and it is not. Angels do not protect children. One, oh my goodness, J. Vernon McGee. Periodically, I do have to mention when the guy goes crazy heretic, he goes crazy heretic on this passage of scripture. I mean, he goes way, way off. And he talks about all little children are saved because their children uh, haven't come to the age of accountability yet. They're still innocent. All I can say is J. Vernon McGee must not have had any children. My children from the word get-go were trouble. 
and they would put their hand on that which was forbidden and then they'd look over at me to see if I'm watching or not. Kids are little sinners and they know it. They don't come to us innocent and somehow we defile them. No, they come born with a sin nature. But his heresy or his teaching is found with a lot of radio preachers. This is very popular on radios in that all infants who are um, going to heaven, if they die in infancy, if they die as a child, they immediately go to heaven. Now, I just want to have you stop and think about that for just one moment. I'm not saying yes or no, okay, at this point. I'm just saying, now tell me about abortion. than any Baptist church in this nation. They're sending way more to heaven. If infants who die in infancy go straight to heaven, good heavens, I wish I would have. Some of you probably wish you would have, you know, can I say it? Finish off your kids before they got to adulthood and really wrecked everything, right? Um, if, I had that, if I had that chance to do over again, think on this. The moment you say, yes, all children go to heaven, you're saying something the Bible doesn't say. My, I quickly add, the Bible does not say that all children are going to hell. Okay? It doesn't speak, it talks about adults. Those that believe are heaven bound. Those without faith are going to eternal fire. So. Understand, they're delving into something that the Bible does not say with a straight voice. Yes, I know that David said, He cannot come to me, but I am going to him. Where did David think he was going? David knew exactly where he was going. He's going to Sheol. He did not believe his child was going to heaven. He did not believe at that point in time because of his illicit sex, that he was going to heaven. But he knew he was going to Sheol, to the grave. Where he's going, I'm going to be there too. So, I don't want to belabor this when really the scripture doesn't even deal with it. But radio preachers on this text immediately run off and say, all children are going to heaven. Um, then I don't know how they can stand against abortion if they're really putting that many people in glory land. I, I shudder. Inside, I'm shuddering at the very prospect of that thought. Humility exemplified in seeking out to the lost. In order to demonstrate the importance God attached to the lost, the Lord gave the disciples an illustration. He says, Suppose a man who owns a hundred sheep suddenly finds out he only got 99. Look at that in verse 12, will you? Where we read, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it, the lost one. Verily I say to you, he rejoices more than that the sheep of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Verse 14. Even so, it's not the will of your Father which is, even so, isn't it not your will of the Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish? He would that none should perish. Once again, mikron tuton. He is not saying, um, I keep taking it off, Pai Dion. He's speaking differently here. Won't he leave them, the ninety and nine, and search for the one until he finds it? And the same way God, your Father in heaven, is concerned about the little ones, verses 6 and 10 mentioned, and doesn't want to lose any of them. Great care must be exercised to avoid all stumbling blocks, offense. And then exemplified in church discipline. 
in verse 15. Moreover, if thy brethren shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two um, more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto... Now this is the second time he uses this word in, in the gospel. The church, ecclesia, the called out ones. But if he neglect to hear the called out ones, the assembly, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto thee, that two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Lord has just spoken about the offenses, the stumbling blocks, the leading to sin. Now he talked about what should be done when known sin occurs. When a brother sins against another brother, the two of them, he says, should sit down and discuss the matter. And did you see the word he's got there? It's in the Greek. Alone. It's a private matter. You don't call him out in church. You don't make it a discussion during the growth groups. <laughs> you don't stop him in the, in the vestibule of the church and chatter with him on the, alone. No one else around, just you and he. If the matter can be settled at that particular level, there's no need to go any, brother, any further. You have received back your brother, is how he puts it. It's beautiful how it's, how it's written there. If the matter can be settled there, so be it. But if the sinning, uh, sinning brother refuses to listen, two or three witnesses should be taken along for a clear testimony. Maybe you're not understanding him. Maybe he's not fully understanding you. Just to open up so that there's true understanding there. This is in keeping with the Old Testament precepts. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15. Deuteronomy 19.15 declares this is what needs to be done. If the sinning brother still fails to recognize his heir, the situation should be told before the entire church or the assembly. The disciples probably would have understood Jesus to mean that the matter should be brought before the Jewish assembly. But later on into the church age, they understood fully what he meant after the day of Pentecost. One who refuses to acknowledge his sin is then to be treated as an outsider, a pagan, or a tax gatherer. That doesn't mean you don't speak with them. That doesn't mean you ostracize them. You say bad things about them in their presence or out of their presence. No, you treat them like you would a lost person. How do you treat the guy at the grocery store? You talk with him because you might have an opportunity to win him to a saving knowledge of Christ. Amen? Amen. And so you treat this person who once was within the fellowship as if they are a potential believer that they could come to know Christ as their Savior. And so you talk to them as a lost man. Look at verse 18. Verily I say to you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree, that word agree, um, is symphoneo gives us our word symphony playing together a, a tune together with various different voices if you shall agree like a, men sitting down to play a symphony 
on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Good enough. And then finally, exemplified in limitless forgiveness. Look at verse 21. Verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought into him, owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment be made. And the servants therefore fell down, and he worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, I will repay thee all. Right. Verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. He loosed him, forgave him the debt. He tells us a parable. and I just read you the first part of that parable. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? Peter was thinking, whoo! Yeah, yeah, because the rabbis said three times, if a man sins against you, forgive him. If he does it again, do it again. If he does it again, do it again. That was the teaching of the rabbis. And so he goes and says, mm, double that. No, make it a perfect number seven. Seven times. He's thinking, whoa, this is way in outer space. Um, yeah. But Jesus' reply is that forgiveness needs to be exercised limitless. Limitless. Not just seven times, but 70 times seven. Oh, uh, 490 times, right? Jesus isn't intending on you saying, okay, Jesse, that's one. And then keep going until <laughs> we're coming real close. That was 489. <laughs> okay? Hey, everybody. No, it's when he says seven, 70 times 7, he's just saying limitless. Right. And nobody counts that far. Um, without count. He meant no limits should be set. And then to complete the idea, he tells this parable. You saw it. About a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. But one servant, oh my goodness, owed him 10,000 talents. This would be equal to roughly about seven to eight million dollars that he owed his master. And when thrown before him the situation the, it was obvious he couldn't pay so the master ordered that the servant the servant's wife the servant's children and all of his possessions be sold to, a, to repay as much of the debt as possible but the servant hits the ground it says he worships him hits the ground in prayer and pleads with his master, begging for time to repay his master. Did you catch that? I, I kind of laughed when I, when I said that. Um, he said, in verse 26, Lord, have patience with me, and I will repay thee all. Is that realistic? No. With a daily salary... Um, in the land of Palestine of being roughly about 16 cents a day, I don't think he's going... So it's really ridiculous. Enough for probably the master, the king, to, to laugh when he, when he heard him say that. But I want you to see something here. He's begging just simply for time to repay. Do you notice? No repentance. 
He doesn't say, oh, Master, I'm so sorry. Oh, my soul. How did this ever happen? Forgive me. Please forgive. How can you see? Please forgive. He doesn't say that. No repentance. And second, <laughs> fantastic pride. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the subject of humility. That's the whole subject of this chapter. And he ends with the most prideful person you ever saw who uses up his master's um, funds to the course of millions of dollars and then says, give me a little time. I'll pay you back. You'll pay... What will... How would you go about... This is pride. Hey, I got this one covered. Can you see that kind of arrogance and pride? And this, it says in verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and he loosened him, and he forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, one hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him, and he took him by the throat, saying, You pay me what you owe. And this fellow servant fell down on the feet, at his feet, and besought him, saying, Listen to the words, the very same words. Have patient with me. I will repay thee all. Is that possible? Yes, it's very possible. A um, hundred days' salary is what he wants to repay. Okay. And he would not. But he went and he cast him into prison till he should pay that debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and they came and they told him to their um, master, <laughs> and, called him, and he called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, um, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou not also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I pity on thee? And his, his Lord was wroth. Strongest word in the Greek language. He was very angry, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him which isn't going to happen. Right. We all know. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, y'all, if y'all from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother and their trespasses. Jesus gives this picture, but shortly thereafter, he recognizes his own servant has not shown any kind of forgiveness. A hundred denarii, one denarii is like 16 cents. Um, he was grieved. The, the uh, other, others, um, friends were grieved, uh, using a word for distress in the Greek language. The Lord was teaching that forgiveness ought to be in direct proportion to the amount that is forgiven. First servant, had been forgiven all. He, in turn, should have forgiven all. all. You got it. A child of God has had all his sins forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, when someone sins against him, he ought to be willing to forgive completely from the heart, no matter how many times that act occurs. So we see humility, and we see it exemplified in childlike faith. Humility. And we see it for seeking the lost. Humility as exemplified in church discipline. Humility as it's exemplified in limitless forgiveness. This is what makes up humility in the teachings of Christ. I ask you this evening, are you humble? Or is self-pride still sitting on that throne in your heart? so easy to let pride step in and total ruin follows.
Let me close by sharing with you that on the 31st of August, 1986, two Russian ships, one passenger liner, the other a freighter, were supposed to pass in the night as they sailed the Black Sea off the coast of southern Russia. The pilot in the passenger liner with 1,234 people aboard had calculated that they were on a collision course with this coming freighter with a cargo of grain. Immediately, he radioed a warning to which the freighter responded, Don't worry. We will pass clear of each other. We will take care of everything. Neither ship altered their course. Neither ship modified their speed. About 45 minutes later, the freighter rammed the starboard side of the passenger liner. The passenger liner was going full steam ahead, ripping a humongous rip along the side of that liner. Within 15 minutes, that 17,000 ton, 525 foot liner sank. It sank so fast that no one was able to loosen even one of the lifeboats. Hundreds of people just simply grabbed a life jacket, grabbed anything out of their bedroom, and they jumped into the sea. 423 people, most of them still in their cabins, not knowing what's gone on, perished. At the inquest, the Soviet authorities said that both captains were fully aware that their ships were on a collision course, that both captains considered their ships much too formidable to be ignored by the other ship, that the other ship should take action. Both disregarded the warnings. Both assumed the other ship would take whatever needed evasive action. Both ships were involved. Both captains thrown in prison for their part in it. And what was it? You can sum it in one word. And so Jesus teaches us on humility. And how does he teach? Who's the greatest? Look at this little kid. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Father, for giving us eternal life as a free gift. Thank you, Father, we don't have to earn it. Thank you, Father, we don't have to fear losing it somehow through misbehavior. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us the right and the privilege of sharing that with other people who are lost and are needing of salvation. We give you praise in the wonderful name of Jesus as we go from this place. Fill us, fill us full of your spirit. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.